Hi, I'm Sean Clark. Today I'm standing in front of Jenny's flat from the film An American Werewolf in London. Welcome to Horrors Hall Grounds. February 2nd, 1981. Day one. This is where it all began. The Moors. Wales. England. Stick to the road. As you can see here, they pull up, turn off here near the sign. That's where he lets the young men out. Now this was not an easy location to get to all the way in Wales, England, but definitely worth the trip. I mean, look at that beautiful view. You can't beat it. If you're a fan of the film, this is a must-see. You gotta go. They get out of the truck, and then it heads down that road there and leaves them to start their little backpacking journey. I mean, look around. Isn't this a fun place? This next scene involves a little bit of movie magic. You cold? Yeah. Good. If you take a look at the direction that Jack and David start walking in, it's actually the opposite direction of where the next scene takes place. Something you would actually never know unless you really visited the location. Just the art of good editing. So this is it, right here. This is where they get out of the truck and it heads off in that direction. Rich went to pee, right down there. Truck comes from this way, truck goes that way, and Jack and David walk this way, heading to the slaughtered lamb. You're talking about the woman I love. I'm talking about a girl you want to fuck, so give me a break. All right. As you can see, that ditch to the left is still there today. The road has barely changed. It's really very simple. She has no choice with the exception of those poles, of course. Look at this shit. How cool is that? It's beautiful. Beautiful day. We didn't get rained on, which is shocking in England. Shocking to not get rained on. I'd scare him. Look at that lot. Fucking A. My hair stood tall and proud all day. Under the rain, not so, not so sure. But hell yeah. Victory. Yeah, we're off to a great start. <laughs> Say knock knock. Knock knock. Who's there? Who? <laughs> don't, don't you get it? The so here is where the boys are walking just before they get to the hill heading down to the slaughtered land. So this is where David and Jack first walk up to the slaughtered lamb. This is located way out in mystical Wales in Crickadon. It's beautiful. It's quite quaint little town. Hardly any traffic, except for this car coming up now, ruining my mystique. <laughs> and it's not really a pub. The exterior of the slaughtered lamb is actually somebody's home. Let's go take a look at it right now. The slaughtered lamb. 
That's kind of strange. I don't know. Would you rather the Hilton? All right. But whatever happens, it's, it's your fault. fault. Right. All right, come on. And here's where the boys come out what of the, the hell pub. What's that all about? I don't know. Let's go up the road and see if there's an inn or something. And they head in this direction. Down this road. Right here, this is where the statue used to be. It was only brought in for production. It wasn't a real statue. As the doctor pulls up, you can see where the fake statue was placed. Right about there. Now when the doctor exits the slaughtered lamb and heads towards his car, he then turns towards the church and notices a man standing there watching him. Look over his shoulder. You see that cemetery there? It's right behind these bushes. If you look closely, you can match up those tombstones over his shoulder, particularly this one here right in the middle. There it is. Look at that guy. He's creepy. Definitely got to go talk to him. Heads over to the cemetery in front of the church. Enters and has a word with the gentleman. Right here. How you doing? I'm trying to find the uh, American War from London locations. Uh, I don't know if the, I know this was used in the film. Do you know where some of the other ones are around here? Uh, maybe maybe some up the um, up the. Hill. That's enough. That's enough. So right here, this is where that confrontation takes place. Next door to the house that's the slaughtered lamb. And it's a pretty awesome location. I mean, this is a beautiful, beautiful town. And obviously a cool, creepy graveyard. I thought it'd be fun just to take a look around this church. Just so you can see how cool this location is. I mean, look at that graveyard it goes way back there. So awesome. These ancient graveyards in Europe are just so beautiful. Don't get nothing like this in the States. Not this old. But you can see this is a really cool old church. Almost looks like a movie set. Love how weathered everything is. This entrance to the church over here was really cool too. Take a look at this. Yeah, I just thought this was neat to kind of just get a look at stuff you don't see in the film. You know, all these years, this is right behind them, and you never get to see it. But now you do, so I'm showing it off. Why not? Basically just making my rounds around the building, and we'll end right where we started. As they say, that's enough. Monday, February 9th, 1981, day seven. Now we enter the interior of the slaughtered lamb. So now we're at the real entrance of the slaughtered lamb. I'm with my friend, you Paul Davis. We've known each other a long time. And since then he's made the documentary Beware the Moon, you did the book Beware the Moon, you've written and directed projects for Blumhouse, and you also have a website now, correct? A YouTube channel. Yeah, or, excuse me. yeah just uh, trying to keep myself uh, a little bit creative in, in between some uh, some film work. Uh, it's called UK Retro Reels, where I essentially try to recreate uh, a UK cinema experience. Uh, and you'll see that right here you'll see the link right here on the screen there see you go. magic uh and i've i've made uh, a uk reel for an american wealth in london so you can check that out in my archive and inside this is the interior of the slard lamb and one thing you'll notice is that the door is very different on the outside as opposed to the inside kind of a continuity flaw really but at least it opened the correct way yeah it opens they go in the story continues 
So we're gonna go and we're gonna have some food and take a look around. Let's Let's do it. Me. I'll follow you, sir. Sounds good. Make sure you duck. So here's the door that Jack and David walk in. This is where we uh, start our adventure. Exactly. It's where the boys meet in pending doom. This is where it all took place four years ago. And the gentleman was over here throwing darts, right? It's where this light fixture is? Correct. That yeah. Yeah. And in fact, the last time I was in here, they, wa they actually had put the dartboard back up. Here this here. was the interior for the slaughtered lamb. The exterior was in Wales, which uh, you've already traveled down from. Yeah. Rather sharpish. I, I backpacked. Have. You backpacked. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, this was uh, in 1981, this was a biker bar that was recommended by one of the uh, crew members who used to drink here and felt that it had a rustic feel to it that would meet the aesthetic of what the slaughtered lamb was. Mm -hmm. And Landis came and saw it and he loved it, uh, but he thought it was too big. Mm. So what they ended up doing is, if you look over this way, this large area here, you can see where there is a beam on the ceiling. Yeah. That is where a fake wall was put in. It's this beam over here. Yeah, with the one that's got the, uh, the little fire attachment on it right there. So this is where the fake wall was put in. So the star would have been... The five-pointed star, right there. yeah, was literally right in the middle there. There was a piece here that was blocked off, okay. which went to a second part of the bar. So whenever there are shots of Lila Kay behind the bar, if you catch it at a particular angle, you can see that the bar has a lot more depth to it. So yeah. you can see that they've closed it off to make it smaller. It's where the boys first get their warning, where we first hear the words, beware the moon. Beware the moon, lads. Tuesday, February 24th, 1981. Exterior, The Moors, Windsor Great Park. What do you think was wrong? I have no idea. Maybe that pentangle was for something supernatural. Well, here we are in Windsor Park. Me and Rich are walking along this path, much like Jack and David did in the film. And this is a path just off the road. And I believe this if anything, looks the most like it did in the film. Nobody knows exactly where it was shot in this park. There's no documentation showing the specific spot. But from what I can see here, this to me looks the most like it. Um, take a look off to behind me over here. See how this area is open, you know, a little bit of bushes, those trees. I mean, it's been 40 plus years. God only knows what could have grown in that time. But this definitely looks like it could be the spot that doubled for the Moors. We know they shot it here. We just don't know the specific area. But the lads veered off into the bushes over here. So you can see, this looks a lot like it. So then the lads would walk out off of the path and head out into this mess. This really does look a lot like it, Rich. I mean, how there's these patches. I agree. And look how far apart the trees are that have been planted. Something just seems to tally up with me from what we see, even though it's dark. Yeah. And of course, there was only, there'd only be a couple of foot high back then. So, you know, we're not going to pinpoint it, but I, I certainly feel we're in the right place. Well, this is as good as this is going to get, unless we can find a piece of Jack's body lying out here somewhere. Friday the 13th, 1981, Hospital Interiors. I'll let Paul Davis explain. The hospital doesn't exist anymore. That was in Putney General. And uh, if I remember correctly, when they were filming, there was an entire floor that was essentially shelled out. And they dressed the, the entire, they, they built their own mock hospital. And that's where all of David's scenes, recovery scenes were shot. But that wasn't the only hospital used. Cheswick Maternity Hospital was also used for some of the scenes, including the doctor's office, as you see right here. Yeah, so from there it would be Jenny's flat. Let's go check that out now. Let's go and have a look. I'll you. Okay. All right, we're heading over to the American Marathon London, Jenny's flat. 
which is this one right there. The blue door. With the blue door and the little bird in the window. That's where David Naughton tried to get in when he locked himself out. I thought it'd be fun to throw in this footage from the first time I went to London back in 2002, just to show you how stoked I was to see these locations for the first time. Old school video recorder, what a difference. So Paul, where are we right now? Right now we are at the exterior of what was Jenny Agatha's flat, Nurse Price in the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, we're here on Colhern Road. I won't say the number of the house, but you'll see it when it goes on camera anyway. <laughs> uh, but uh, this is where David gets locked out of the flat and tries to get back in through the window. This middle window right here, mm -hmm. um, you know, the little stoop right there is where you get hissed out by the cat. This sidewalk where I'm standing right now is where the two creepy little girls start giggling at him. Um, and he has the little uh, altercation with the dog that knows what's up. Yeah. Um, and yeah, essentially the, this, this was uh, the exterior that they used. Now when it came to the interiors, they'd already built the Alex flat on the stage at Twickenham Studios. Um, and they'd done their best because they, they'd already found this spot, they tried to match what they were doing at Twickenham with what the exterior presented. So if you look, there are only, there's only one shot from inside the actual flat, and that's when David climbs back in through the window and they, you know, the shot is tight enough so that they could mask everything else um, that was uh, being prepared over at Twickenham. But one thing that they, they didn't take into consideration is there's one shot after Alex and David come across the street and they go inside the flat for the first time. When they actually go inside the uh, hallway, there's a door on the right-hand side that wasn't actually there. So they built a fake wall so that it would match the door that they had on the interior side. Ah. So um, that's how they got around that. But uh, yeah, this is, this is the place and it still looks exactly the same and 40 it's... years later. And it's currently vacant. It is. And, no and, werewolves here. Yeah. So, unfortunately, we can't get inside because nobody lives there. But you can actually see in through the window right here. And you can see that you know, right here, this is the bench that David climbed onto from coming through that window right there. And you can see they matched it very, very closely because if you look... You you look at the fireplace there it it looks exactly like the one in the film it's, it's pretty identical yeah i mean so they did a really good job of matching that beautiful church across the street you know, that's saint luke's yes yeah really saint nice. luke's church and one of the things about this uh this area it was very central to a lot of the other places that they were that they were using for the movie because Landis at the time was based in Chiswick, which isn't too far away. Mm -hmm. So um, it was easier for him to get to in the morning <laughs> when they needed to go on location. The dream sequences of David running through the woods were shot in the woods just behind Pinewood Studios. The exact spots are unknown. Thursday, February 26, 1981, day 22, exterior and interior of Sean's flat. No, not my flat. Sean in the movie. So here's the scene where the posh couple pulls up and parks in front of the building right here. The car pulls up here and the couple gets out. Which one, Harry? I'm a 39. They start to head into the building here and they decide to play a little prank on him and head in this direction. A couple things that are interesting when they pass this pillar here, it's still here. There was another one that's gone. There's another one over here but there was one closer to this, but I believe that's the original one as seen in the film. And then they head off into this direction where it gets pretty dark over here. Let's go take a look. I 
Now this is like legit, like the frickin' movie right here. <laughs> All right, so they head around this corner here and they go over here. They stop right about in this area and that's when they get attacked. Right about here. Sean comes walking out the door here, opens up the gate, and asks, Is anyone there? And he proceeds in this direction. Walking around here a little bit, looking to see if he can find anything. Then he steps on something. Looks down, and it's a hand. So what is it we're looking at right now, Paul? So what we're looking at here, I mean, you can, you can tell by Tower Bridge in the background. Uh, it looks nothing like it did back in 1981, but down on the banks on the right-hand side is where the uh, sequence with the bombs took place. Uh, they blocked out an entire night to shoot it, but they were pretty much done with the scene as it was written in a couple of hours. I mean, the, the thing that took the longest is to light Tower Bridge uh, when they shot the sequence. The legend says that they also filmed a, uh, a sequence in which the bums, one by one, were mutilated by the werewolf. Now, I've asked everybody who worked on the movie whether or not this scene existed. It insists that he not only shot it, but it was in his first two previews in New York and Chicago, and then subsequently it was cut because people kept talking over the following scene, and he felt that they were missing all the exposition that was being done. So he cut the scene from the movie, and it's never been seen since. Who, who is that that claims this? Uh, that would be Mr. Landis himself. Ah. So, but he's told me about the sequence in great detail, so I have no reason to doubt him. But, it but just, you have a reason to doubt him. But, but <laughs> just the fact that nobody else who was there that night remembers it. And the three actors who, who played the, uh, the derelicts are no longer with us, sadly, and, and had already passed away by the time I'd done both the documentary and the book. So I haven't been able to confirm it either way, but Landis insists that it exists. But it's uh, it's lost to uh, to myth. It's folklore. Legend. It's folklore. There's no evidence. There's no photographs from the scene. There's nothing. Correct. Okay. Uh, but that would have taken place right down here. Absolutely. Yeah. Wednesday, February twenty fifth, nineteen eighty one. Interior tube station. This is the station, right down here. The train comes up and gets off down there. Our adventure begins for poor Michael Carter, AKA Bib Fortuna from Return of the Jedi. Hello? Is there someone there? I shall report this. It's right down here. Good Lord. Now this area here is completely changed. This is it today. 
Now, if you look here, down this hallway, there used to be a pipe that went down the center and divided it. And right here was that half circle. I took a photo of it when I visited back in 2008. You can see it right here when it still existed before it was remodeled. Now this area that he runs down after he comes around the corner, this is that hallway with the dividing pipes down the middle. There it is in 2008. This is also the same one he jumps over right here. And there's a photo again, 2008. Unfortunately, those spots don't exist anymore as they were in the film. But everybody knows this spot. Come on. This is where things are about to get real. Real bad for Mr. Carter. Look at that. Uh-oh. Now we head to the London Zoo. A lot of it looks the same as you can see some of these here. However, the area with the wolves in it no longer exists. Okay, so upon further review, there's a scene where he jumps out of a bush, I believe it was like right about here, and pans over here to the woman. This is all new construction over here. This was all the lawn area with some trees. I believe they probably stole the shot, cheated the shot, where he talks to the little boy because you don't really see them in the same shot together. He's just looking. And I believe that was shot in another area, which we were gonna try to find. But the gorillas are right over here, which makes sense when you're looking at the shot in this direction, the gorilla sign over here pointing in this way. Excuse me. That would be the only place that that sign would be because the gorillas are kind of near the front and it has to be the spot. It has to be. And it makes sense because this is all clearly new, you know. This is all clearly new. Maybe I'm rambling on too much about this, but I wanted to find the spot and I think we found it. I believe right here is where the boy was looking at the monkeys, like this little guy right here. What's up? What's happening, pal? That's right. So if you look, you can see behind him, these bars, he's got the double bars, and then at the bottom you can see these bricks, the different levels. You can see that at a couple different angles. But this area here goes from there to right there, and it does look towards the monkeys. So I think this is where the little kid was standing with the balloons. What's up, my man? Eat that banana. That's right. You just take them bananas. Yeah, that's right. You're going to be on horse hog grounds. How stoked are you right now? I'd be super stoked. You're going to become famous in the United States. Trust me. Yep, no, famous. I'm not kidding. Yes, love? A naked American man stole my balloon. What? <laughs> this is the scene where David runs by and grabs the coat. The bench would have been right about here. He runs from that direction, grabs it, and continues that way. This is one of the only locations left at the zoo that looks exactly like the film. Right here. So right now I'm standing where the newspaper stand was located where Dr. Hirsch sees the headline about the werewolf attack or the murders. It would have been right about here. One thing you can notice, see that sign right there? That was the haircut sign in the film. Still still there, same, same shape, but obviously a different business. But you can make out the buildings in the background to see that the newsstand was right here. 
not sure if that was an actual newspaper stand that was here, but it's strange that this location is kind of away from other ones. I don't know why they chose this spot in Putney, but whatever, it worked. And this is was kind of a tricky one to find. My good friend Rich sorted it and Paul Davis also helped out on it. But we got this one locked in. Boom. A lot of weather we've been having lately. So right now I'm at the bus stop from an American Rough in London. This is on Prince Albert Road. One thing you can match up in this shot is these buildings in the background. You can see them quite clearly. Let's take a closer look. It appears that the bus stop might have been a little bit over to the right where it used to be because if you match up in the shot where they're about to get on the bus it's pretty much this exact shot in the background we should be able to get a taxi here yeah. you know i should be committed here we are yeah. this is where alex and david are heading to the cab notice this post box still here looks the same they walk past number 35. This is after the night David had where he can't remember anything, but he feels rejuvenated, like a new man. And he's about to find out why. They walk along here, see this door as well. And parked right here where these motorcycles are is the cab that they get in. They get in the cab, and unfortunately, David finds out a little secret about himself. Man. So where are we now, Paul? Okay, so we are at the scene of the moment David realizes that maybe Jack is telling the truth the whole time. Mm -hmm. You can probably recognize behind me, this is where Jenny and David exit the cab and make their way all the way through Trafalgar Square, which at the time was one of the longest dolly shots ever constructed in London. And they head all the way over to the, the central monument where David tries to convince a police officer that he may have been responsible for the previous night's lunar activities. And you're saying that all this has been developed since filming. Correct, what's, yeah. what's been added? So the fountain here has been added. There's another fountain behind me that was added since. Mm -hmm. I mean, this has been such a, this is such a huge tourist area that basically they're just giving people more stuff to do and take pictures of. So. Um, but at the time, there was a lot more space for them to add a, a 60 foot dolly track and uh, have an entire camera crew behind it that, uh, that could set it up. But, but that was one of the things with this movie. I mean, given you had the whole big stunt sequence in Piccadilly Circus, which naturally you would have to get permission for and you would have to talk to the local police. But as for everything else that was shot in London, it was literally down to whatever police officer was walking the beat that day. You know, if they'd laid the track, and started filming, he could stop them during a take and say, you're not supposed to be here, fuck off, basically. Yeah. And that was it. You couldn't film for the rest of the day. And then you'd come back the following day and hope that it was somebody else, somebody else that was a little bit more understanding. But from what I understand, they didn't have that problem on the movie. You know, I don't think there was a single scene where they were told that they could not shoot. You know, because I think the Blues Brothers was not long off general release at the time. Mm. So as soon as someone could just point at Landis and say he directed the Blues Brothers, it'd be like, okay, yeah, fine. <laughs> you weren't even allowed to film your dock here, right? That's correct, yeah. Um, the security in this area is pretty strict because there are a lot of government buildings and a lot of consulate buildings. So any kind of professional, uh, not to say that this isn't professional, Sean. Hey now. But um, those who aren't filming uh, on an iPhone covertly and smartly like you are, would get flagged, yeah. you know, because they want to know who you, what you're shooting for. And so, yeah, we weren't allowed to shoot the dock here. So I'm, I'm glad that we're, we're finally presenting this location in a legitimate video about American Wealth in London. A proper video. A proper one. 
Well, let's let's take a look at where it was that that scene actually happened. You, so yeah, was, absolutely. So it's kind of shot here, right? Yeah. So the, the dolly shot ends with David running off camera, and then it cuts to around this line here. But the, the thing that kind of really stands out is there is a wide shot where you can see Big Ben in the background. So which this we is, can see. Yeah. So this is exactly where the, the camera would have been situated. Deuce, I gotta get out of here. David, don't lose control. So where are we standing right now? This is the exact spot where they placed their prop phone booth for David Kessler to make his phone back to his uh, parents. What angle was it shooting? It was shooting with, so, uh, with yeah, the statue so they, in the background, so right? from where I'm standing, the camera would have been where you are now, David inside the box, and it kind of pans around mm -hmm. as David is uh, talking to his sister, Rachel. And you can see the, uh, the advertising boards in the background. And again, if you look at the movie, you'll see what I meant by the statue being in a different place. Because it's further over towards the front of the uh, exterior of the cinema. Uh, yes, operator, I'd like to call the United States and reverse the charges. John Clark. For anyone. Saturday, February 28th, Day 23, Exterior Piccadilly Circus and Aero Cinema. Paul, where are we right now? We are at the scene of the crime, as it were. The finale. The finale. Yeah. You know, if ever there was going to be a true crime documentary on an American werewolf in London and what happened, this is, this is where you go. Yeah. yeah. So tell me about this spot. You said that this actually has been moved from yeah, where it was. Yeah, originally, so all of this has, since uh, 1981, uh, when it was shot, has been pedestrianized. Uh, all of this was, you know, the statue itself was actually a roundabout, so everything was oncoming traffic in every direction. Uh, the statue itself was moved further over um, in this general direction where you can see my hand mm -hmm. doing this. The theater itself was just on the corner there of Shaftesbury and Piccadilly and this whole uh, area about Story High was recreated down at a uh, airfield in Weybridge. I think it's a it's a race course now they do a lot of uh, like rally racing and that kind of stuff but that's where Alf Joint who was the stunt arranger with Vic Armstrong, uh, Paul Weston, Rocky Taylor all these big British stunt guys at the time uh, spent six weeks uh, rehearsing the entire stunt sequence before they actually came to the real location. Uh, and the stunt itself, when they filmed it, uh, they had to do it over two nights. So they filmed early hours of the morning, Saturday going into Sunday, and then Sunday into Monday. They couldn't stop the traffic. Now, one of the biggest things that they had coming to shoot the sequence is that 15 years prior, the great Michael Winner, I say that with a, <laughs> with a smirk, He'd shot a scene in Piccadilly Circus at the height of the IRA bombing, uh, where he actually blew up a van. And he didn't get wow. any permission to do it, and everybody thought that it was a terrorist attack. So from that point onward, the police, uh, the Metropolitan Police said no filming in Piccadilly or any kind of built-up London areas. So An American Wealth in London was the first movie that was given permission to film in Piccadilly since Michael Winner blew up a van, gotcha. uh, which was 15 years prior. Uh, but even then, the, the police were very um, hesitant to let Landis and crew come and film here. Uh, specifically because they told them exactly what they wanted to do. Yeah. You know, which um, the first thing they said was, well, you can't stop traffic, so how are you going to do that? And Landis then kind of just passed the buck onto the first assistant director, David Tringham, to basically just wing it and explain how he is a first assistant director would arrange that to happen so essentially what they did and i've got copies of the original maps here that were made by david tringham they had all of these stunt cars now all the ones that are circled in red at the front were the actual stunt performers that would come out and do the damage and the guys that are circled behind were their specific instructions were to slow down the actual on incoming traffic so they literally had three minutes to do the entire stunt clear it up and then let traffic through and they did that continuously throughout the night. I think they did it about six times over two nights to get all of the coverage they needed. And now on the second map here, that shows the placement of all seven cameras that were, ah. that were used. So we had one 
up here, which used to be, you see the, the balcony up there, it's a department store called Swan and oh, Edgar back oh, in the day. let's see. So this balcony right yep, there. That balcony, you had one camera placed up there. Mm -hmm. You had two cameras that were down at ground level that were in front of the statue. So they were capturing as much of the, uh, the action you know, as close as they could. Mm -hmm. Then you had a camera up high. I don't know if you can see behind that scaffolding. Yeah. That's on, on yeah, the building on there. On the scaffolding there, you can see a little balcony there. That's where another camera was placed. Got it, yep. You had another one right up on this balcony up here. What, the one up there or the yeah. one where the sign is? The okay. one, the one where the... The little tiny yeah, The little tiny that one, one right yep, there. That's the one. Okay. And uh, then you had two in the street just behind the statue so they had the scene well and truly covered mm -hmm. you know and you're getting that kind of coverage over two nights you know you're getting all the wide shots they also had cameras in uh, i think they had one in a taxi they had one on the bus and there's even a, a, a famous outtake that's on the dvd of uh, landis playing one of the pedestrians on the bus they had a, a camera up on the top deck and as the bus spins you see everybody on the top deck being shunted around and and Landis is the one right at the front being the most theatrical. Um, but yeah, this is where it all happens. Let's go over and take a look at where the theater was. Uh -huh. It was right here, right in this corner here. So this little, this little entrance here on the right-hand side is where the theater was. Oh, the theater, okay. So this has been completely redone because yeah. I was here in 2000, I think 2002 was the first time I came to London mm -hmm. and they still had the theater marquee, like the the, the the part that stuck out that wouldn't like a theater sign. So that was here. For yeah. some reason, my memory was it was over there. Well, there's a reason for that. After looking back at my old footage from 2002, I realized all these years, I thought the theater was in a different place. As you can see, I'm walking away from where the theater was across Piccadilly, and I'm heading over to this other area. Now, one thing to point out here that is really cool, I just have to point out, is look, Tower Records. How rad is that? Frickin' Tower Records. God, I miss it. I remember going into that store while I was there, too. But anyway, across the street here is where I thought it was because there was an old movie marquee and they were using it for the sign for this gift shop. But this is where I thought the theater was. And even the second time I came back in 2008, I still thought this is where it was. And clearly, when I was talking to Paul, in my head I was still convinced maybe I was in the wrong spot until he pointed it out to me. And of course, in the editing, you discover all kinds of things. You start to realize, oh, this is there, that is blah, blah, blah. But as you can see, it says cinema. I thought this was it. Look at me. Dorky with the backpack. To be fair, I'm still pretty dorky looking. But back then, what made it even worse was I had glasses and a flavor saver. Come on, man. What was I thinking? Anyway, let's get back to the episode. Ugh. Now, this used to be, uh, this whole area, goes, it used to be like a little food court. So okay. behind there, it kind of goes in, and then there were little storefronts on the inside there, which again had changed since it was in, in 1981, because this is where like the Bureau de Change would be, uh -huh. and all that kind of stuff, where Landis went through the window. The, uh, the theatre was operating until 1985, and um, it was still showing softcore porno at the time, but ironically the last movie to play there was Bolero, starring Bo Derrick. So, which was softcore porno, basically. Which was softcore porno. <laughs> so. Now we're going to head to the actual finale of the film, which is the alley where David meets his demise. Absolutely. Or does he? Sequel. Come on. It's now become a tradition since the popularity of American War of London that they do dance-offs at Piccadilly Square. Sometimes they do it to Bad Moon Rising, but right now there's another song playing. But it has become a big thing here. Isn't that true, Paul? I would, I would yeah, lie about loser, that. The loser, it's Death by Firing Squad. Yeah. So where are we now, Paul? So this one's actually a little known uh, location on American World in London. It's a very brief sequence where Jenny Agatha and uh, uh, John Woodwine get out of the cab when they're on their way for the final showdown with uh, David. Which is where we're headed now. Which is where yeah. we're heading now. Uh, so it makes sense that we kind of slip this in. This is the, uh, the Empire Cinema 
in Leicester Square. And you're uh, saying this used to be a street? Yeah, yeah. At the time, this was a, this was a functioning street. It wasn't pedestrianised, so uh, yeah, it's literally down the street from Piccadilly where we were just filming. So uh, a quick moment to get a pickup shot of uh, our two heroes to make their final face to face with uh, Mr. Kessler. So this this statue of Harrison Ford, Indiana Jones, he said was just put up. Yep, 26th of June. Ah, that's awesome. It's a good, it's a good likeness too. Not bad. That's cool. Right here by the Odeon and right by the scene where Jenny gets out of the cab. So where are we at now, Paul? So we are at the spot where a lot of people, including yourself, I made the mistake in my horizontal grounds article in the magazine, but I'm here to I'm here to fix that in the video episode. We're fixing it now. So a yeah. lot of people seem to think that the the final alleyway at the end of the uh, the final alleyway in American Wealth <laughs> in London yes. was shot in Winchester Walk, but uh, it wasn't. Which is right behind us, right? Is Winchester Walk right behind us. Yeah. It was actually shot. One street over in Clink Street, which we're going to head over to now. Let's go check it out. Let's go. Friday, March 20th, 1981, Clink Street. So this is the tunnel leading to the alley. Yeah, on our way to the alleyway, there is a very brief shot of cops running through. If you look in the actual movie, that same little break in the archway completely unchanged as it was 40 years ago. Uh, yeah, I think we should head on down to the final alley. Let's check it out. So here we are in Twink Street, the scene of the final showdown in an American werewolf in London. And directly behind me is where the stream of cops appear from to chase down the wolf after the mayhem in Piccadilly, which in reality are roughly two miles away from each other. Now this doorway here is one of the few elements that remain from 1981 as it's clearly seen behind the crowd as they make their way towards the foot of the alleyway. It's literally a few paces forward here where the police line up and aim down towards the accursed David Kessler. And if you come around here, you can see the original lip of the curb is still there, even though all of this is brand new. This was a this was street here, right? This was a street, yeah, and all this was working roads at the time. It's since been pedestrianised. A lot of these buildings have been completely rebuilt and repurposed. And this was a parking lot over here. If you watch the movie back, you can see that they're in line with the lip. And you can see that these doors and windows are behind them. If you turn around and look at what they're pointing their guns at back in the day, it's completely unrecognizable now. And down there is where David Kessler met his final resting place. They built the false wall right by where the pillars are. And they had a hole in the back of it because they were using the full wolf suit which had a plank out the back so that the, uh, the performer who was uh, inside the wolf suit, which throughout the production was a tag team effort between Kevin Brennan, who was one of Rick Baker's uh, original makeup crew, and a ballet dancer called Brendan Hughes, who they had seen during a dance sequence in the Sean Connery movie Outland. He was very nimble, very strong upper body, and they felt like you know, you could get the movement from a person like that inside this wolf suit because it was very demanding. It was almost like the wheelbarrow races you used to do as a kid where you'd hold, the, hold a person's feet and they'd run on their hands. So you had to be physically fit to do that. There was also a deleted scene here. It's not been spoken about very, very much, but I found evidence of it existing. I found a still of uh, John Landis adding blood to the scene as he often did. And it's in the original script. When the wolf first runs down the alleyway, a lone cop decides to, cha to chase it. And when the rifle squad turn up and aim their guns, one of them gets a bit trigger happy to begin with and actually takes a shot and shoots the cop in the back. Huh. 
Now, it was well masked so that in the editing you didn't see the cop's body on the ground or anything like that. But they actually did shoot it. And uh, there's a little section in my book, I think someone mentions it, where they did, they, the guy who did the stunt, I can't remember who the stunt man was, but a lot of people, the same people were saying that it was like the most impressive stunt that they saw in the entire movie and it ended up in the cutting room floor. Hmm. But, uh, you ever asked John why he cut it? Uh, I think it was unnecessary. I think by this point you just had the whole Piccadilly sequence. Time to end the movie. Let's get the people, let's get the people out. We've excited them enough. Okay, so we're heading to the spot where David, his final resting place, right, would have been right in front of where this false wall was. They have no idea that they're walking over sacred ground. They just think it's a walkway. Wouldn't it have been like roughly right here somewhere? And yeah, David Kessler would have been laying right here. And Jenny would have been where you are, Sean. With her In little, tears. Yeah. Shedding the final tears before the Marcells tell you it's time to go home. Blah, 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 blah. Which is pretty much what we're going to have to do now. Yeah. I think, Unfortunately. Uh, I think we've covered everything. But as you can see, some things look pretty much the same, but sadly a lot of things have moved on over four Well, years. you know what? I don't know about you, but I still got a second wind. What do you say we jot on down over to Paris and hit the sequel? See ya. So an American Wealth in London is the first... Oh, you can't quite be here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he, he likes your hair. He does. Hair. Let's see. Uh, look, now I'm gonna attack. <laughs> That's a good outbreak. <laughs> An American bee in London. There we go. The werewolf problem is taken care of. Yeah. Bees, that's another thing. Yeah.